Hello, I'm Chrissy Seaton and welcome back to my channel. This video continues on with the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. And um, there are two previous videos that you can look back on. Not that they are consecutive, but in a way they have a common thread you might like to follow through on. However, let's talk about today's video. And um, it's, it's all about coming out of the darkness. Now, the 10 plagues uh, that went through Egypt, they had a purpose. And uh, that was other than, other than the punishment uh, of Egypt and um, you know Egypt's cruelty was paramount at the time so uh, but it was to prove that Hashem is the only one true God and it says that in Exodus chapter 8 verses 8 to 19 I am Hashem in the midst of the land and uh, so it says that here, and we need to um, concentrate on that. Uh, it, there is only one true God. It doesn't matter how you frame the argument or, or, or the presentation, it all comes back to one legitimate thing, one true and only God. It says, I am Hashem in the midst of the land. Now, Israel, Egypt and the entire world, that is in the past and to some extent in the future, now, uh, pr present time. Uh, and it, it can realise that all the philosophies and debates, whether they be, uh, how shall I say, um, educational debates or just, you know, discussions, uh, casual discussions, etc. Um, the, the, these debates on life, living, and the purpose were just a smokescreen, and they still are, to block the spiritual light of Hashem, and uh, who is that one true and only God? And I'm just wondering, some of the debates and smoke screens we see, you've only got to listen to some of the parliamentary debates in your country that are broadcast probably. And, um, and, and of course, watching news uh, stations, you know, those, those um, alternate news <laughs> stations that uh, purport all sorts of things. We really are... <clears throat> <clears throat> blindly pursuing some uh, causes and uh, followings and opinions that certainly aren't, uh, how shall we say, in the light of Hashem. They're not spiritual. They're not, um, they're not causes based on common sense and righteousness and for the betterment of man. And I, I know you could all off the top of your head name a few of those right now. And let's, let's face it, climate change is one of them. So that'll just give you a head start where to go from there. I'm just having a bit of trouble here with my cat. Wants to play with the pages. But anyway, might have that fixed now. Um, so all these philosophies and debates like were going on in the time of... Um, Egypt in, in the time of the plague. So we're all certainly not concentrating on the light of Hashem. They were way off the mark. And it goes on and we talk about that smoke screen is all about blocking that spiritual divine light of Hashem. And it is. You think about that. The smoke screen of those debates takes our mind away from, from prioritising Hashem as our one true and only God and the divine light that emanates through Hashem. So he's the one true God. And Genesis 1 verse 1 will tell us that in no uncertain terms because it states 
you know, that um, he is, oh, I think if I can find Genesis 1, 1 here. Yes, here we go. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth. So in the very first uh, phrase, in the beginning of God's creating. That's the very first phrase in the book of Genesis. So there you have it right up front. Now, I'm going to read also a Torah commentary on um, Exodus. And this is, um, uh, whatever, I think it's 8.8. Eight. Just let me check this here. Chapter 8 of Exodus, and it's verses 18 and 19. So let me just read the two verses first from Exodus. And it says, and on that day I shall set apart the land of Goshen upon which my people stands, that there shall be no swarm there, so that you will know that I am Hashem in the midst of Israel. I shall make a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will come about. Now, let's just... Let's just deal with this realistically now and look at some of the commentary. Commentary on verses 18 and 19 of chapter 8 of Exodus. It says here, I shall set apart, I shall make a distinction. The apparent redundancy refers to two separate features of the distinction between the Jews and the Egyptians. First, God said that he would keep the swarm from entering Goshen. And secondly, the animals would not harm Jews anywhere, even if they were in the land of Egypt. That the animals did not enter Goshen was miraculous because they came from far off lands and were far more mobile than any of the previous plagues, being fully capable of running to every part of the country. That they were barred from Goshen was proof that I am Hashem in the midst of the land. Explanation for verse 19. Tomorrow. This is the only time that Moses specified the starting point of a plague. This may be because, as noticed above, the swarm was different from the other plagues in that the animals were already in existence and were on the way to Egypt from their various habitats. Thus, Pharaoh might have contended that the swarm was a natural phenomena that was already in progress. Therefore, Moses foretold that it would come about the next day, something he could not have known except through God. So, there we have that. Now, also going on from that, I want to digress now to Psalm 19 verse 2 and a commentary there. And I'll just uh, lay my books aside there. Now, verse nine, uh, chapter 19 um, of Psalms, and this is... Uh, Verse 2, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament tells of his handiwork. Okay, now let's have a look at that commentary. The commentary of chapter 19 and the general overall commentary says, the heavenly bodies orbiting with flawless precision in the skies are a clear manifestation of the wisdom and power of the creator. Through them, God reveals himself to mankind. Nevertheless, the celestial panorama is not the ultimate form of divine revelation. Rather, it is the study of God's will as revealed in the Torah that presents the clearest available perception of the creator. If the diligent scholar's quest for God is sincere, he will be assisted 
in his studies by the Holy, by a Holy Spirit somewhat akin to prophecy. The comprehension of God gained through Torah scholarship will surpass the perception gained through empirical research. I'll read that again. The comprehension of God gained through Torah scholarship will surpass the perception gained through empirical research. The psalm begins with the wonders of the heavens and then turns to the wonders of Torah study. It says in verse 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, and that uh, clarifies there is no verbal communication between the heavens and humanity. Rather, the astounding actions and the luminaries declare the glory of God in an eloquent manner that is the equivalent of speech. Alternately, the celestial bodies stir mankind to declare the glory of God's work and to praise and bless him for the heavenly lights. And it goes on and explains about, and the firmament tells of his handiwork. Heavens uh, refer to the upper spheres where the planets and stars orbit while firmament is the sky where evaporated moisture forms clouds and becomes precipitation, rain, in other words. The Talmud teaches that the firmament testifies to the deeds of righteous people in whose merit the rain descends to earth. Mm -hmm. So it goes on. And with more explanations. However, that is, uh, I'll, I'll stop that reading there from the book of Psalms I had here. So, let's get back to the ninth plague. Now, darkness, it, it was uh, darkness, I should say, but it did cause mankind to remember that the second divine utterance was, let there be light. Mm -hmm. And in Exodus 10, verse 23, and for all the children of Israel, there was light in their dwellings. Now, that is very interesting. There was light in the dwellings of the of the um, children of Israel, but not anywhere else. Another divine intervention. I wonder if that spiritual, and this is just my thought, I wonder if that spiritually brilliant light might be reserved for the righteous in the future. You know, you just think that this... That happened in the past. I wonder will that be, is that a foretelling of how things will be in the future? That's just my thought. I don't know whether it, it's a valid thought, but um, I do ponder on that at times. Okay, let's go on. Uh, now, there's something I want to read here, uh, and it's about the earnest repenter. And this, again, is from the book of Ecclesiastes. This is just the introduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, I can't get away from that um, because I just find it. So um, it, it just immerses you into not only the um, the descriptions etc given in the book and the explanations but it immerses you into your own thoughts and diversions as well so i just find it a great prompter prompts you to think further about other things so let's read this here and it says the earnest repenter can surpass the righteous thanks to his remorse over what was and what was meaning what he did and his determination to make a better future. The greater his remorse and determination, the greater his repentance. The greater the sinner, the greater his potential for goodness because 
Once the urge to repent comes to him, it intensifies with every sin. So meaning down the track, if that repenter is tempted to sin again or does sin, um, it, 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 it potentiates that remorsefulness and that need to repent. So this explains why in the case of the most perfect repentance, sins are transformed into merits. Now, just need to get your head around that. It goes on here and says, Before the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, there was the blackness of Egyptian exile and slavery. The impetus for the construction of the Holy Temple was the Philistine destruction of the Mishkan, which was itself built after the sin of the golden calf. Again, light emanated from darkness as the Mishkan became an indirect product of the golden calf. So there is, um, how shall I say, uh, pause for us to think about that section on the earnest repenter. If we are just giving lip service and saying, oh, I'm sorry, Hashem, I did this, I did that, you know, but don't do We'll forget about that. Well, it won't do. You have to be earnestly concerned that you have adequately repented in the appropriate way for whatever sin it was you committed, whatever wrong you did. And so because that remorse and determination uh, with that truthful and sincere um, repentance that improves yourself and it also it also stimulates you to know Hashem better, to know Hashem intimately, um, to recognise his divine power, his um, divine compassion and his infinite love for us, his children. So, you know, we do need... Um, to think very clearly about that. Now, Solomon's life, let's get back to Solomon. Solomon, uh, he was surrounded by the ultimate in luxury. Every comfort he could possibly need or desire, peace, uh, security, uh, riches, and yet he still recognised that the true light was the spiritual form of light emanating from Hashem. So the mind, the heart and the soul was what accomplished greatness, not extreme wealth, palaces, magnificent horses, jewels, etc. It was that mind, heart and soul in the awareness bathing in the awareness of the divine of, of Hashem. So that's what we need to think about and concentrate on. To just end off this, there is a, a lovely little paragraph or uh, well, sentence really, and it uh, d just adds strength to what I've just now talked about with Solomon's life and the distinction between his opulent wealth, etc., and luxury, and that of being um, in the light. Recognise the divine source of everything. And this little sentence, this paragraph says, Greatness um, is not a product born of complacency. It is forged from the tension of struggle to emerge from darkness and create light. Solomon's life work was to wallow in darkness that masqueraded as light, to indulge in comfort, pleasure and luxury, to reign in peace and security and still uh, to, to recognise that the true light was spiritual, that great accomplishment was in the mind, the heart and the soul. So he testifies that he denied himself virtually nothing in his life. 
Um, and of course, you all know that, you know, he had several wives, many wives, and every imaginable, um, you know, beyond our wildest dreams of luxury and wealth. So, now, what are we going to glean from this part, this information today? Well, first of all, we must understand that our repentance has to be um, true remorse and sincere, and that we don't need all the wealth in the world to, do, to accomplish God's choices for us. He gives each of us a purpose and we are to know that purpose and we are to do the will of Hashem. That we have something important to do. Our life wasn't uh, just uh, a figment of, you know, a whim or whatever. It is create. We are here because divine uh, creativity, because Hashem desired to have us here on this earth. He desired to have us as one of his loving children. So we need to start thinking about the simple things versus all the complicated layers. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoy reading your comments and please take care and God bless.